Welcome back. And welcome to our first plenary session of the day. Uh, I'm going to keep this very brief. Uh, morning tea. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we have this session and then we have lunch after that. So uh, thank you very much for making your way back in. And I'm going to hand over now to the chair for this session, Associate Professor Dr. Jacinta Ruru from the University of Otago. Jacinta. Uh, my name is Jacinta Ruru. I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Otago here and um, also play an editorship leadership role with the Resource Management Law Association. So I teach and research the legal possibilities for Indigenous peoples to own, manage and govern land and water. And so this next panel discussion is very dear to my heart, and it's with my honour that I introduce two very special people in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Deputy Chief Judge Karen Fox and Komatoa Edward Allison. So to introduce Deputy Chief Judge Karen Fox, she's had a very prominent career in New Zealand as a lawyer, academic and judge, in the 1990s, Judge Fox blazed a trail in academia as one of our first Māori law academics in New Zealand, where she published significant work on tenoranga tiratanga, constitutional law and human rights, work that I still go back to in my own um, academic work today. In fact, um, it's her work in international human rights that saw Judge Fox be appointed the Harkness Fellow in the USA in 1991-1992. And later she won the New Zealand Human Rights Commission 2000 Millennium Medal. In 2000, Karen was appointed as judge in the Māori Land Court and presiding officer in the Waitangi Tribunal. In 2009, Judge Fox was appointed alternate judge in the Environment Court and in 2010, Deputy Chief Judge of the Māori Land Court. Turning to Edward Allison, who's kaumātua at the Otako Marae, very close to here in Dunedin, while he may wish to be introduced simply as a farmer on the Otago Peninsula, <laughs> Edward, has had, Edward has had a long experience in local and national environmental issues. He currently chairs Kaitahu Ki Otago, a Dunedin-based environmental consultation centre, and is a hearings commissioner for the Environment Canterbury. Um, Edward has previously served on the Otago University Council, the Waitaki Water Allocation Board, the Otago Conservation Board, New Zealand Conservation Authority, QE2 National Trust Board, the Otago Peninsula Biodiversity Group that I heard that he just um, resigned from last night, <laughs> and was former Deputy Kaifakahairi for Te Runangaro Naitahu. So Edward uh, has a wealth of experience of two decades of advocacy and resource management issues in um, Otago. And so it is with my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers and to welcome you to this really important panel discussion today and really look forward to the wisdom that you're both willing to share with us today. Um, so kia ora koutou, um, yeah, welcome. Judge Fox. Um, <clears throat> I would like to thank you for joining us in the future of the future of the future. I can't even read my own writing. Kai te rua hiki hiki. Koe rā te hapu o tēnei wāhi, kā tahi anō au korongo au tēnei kōrero. Engari, te mihi atu au ki āko i tarangatira, nā au anō te mahi tuku whakamoimiti ki te atu au tēnei rangi. Koutou katoa o kaitahu i konei, tēnei koutou. O tira ki a ngāti māmo e hoki mehe mea kei konei e tahi o koutou. Tēnei koutou, tēnei koutou. Ngā mema o tēnei rōpū, tēnei koutou. O tira ki ngā kaiwhakawā o te kōti taiao, tēnā koutou katoa. I just want to greet all of you, um, the people of this place, uh, kai te rua hiki hiki, as we heard this morning. 
um, Ngai Tahu generally and Ngāti Māmoi, I understand that they may have overlapping interests, not necessarily here, but somewhere in the south here. Um, and uh, people of this organisation, the organisers, and most of all, I also want to mihi to my fellow judges um, on the Environment Court. Um, now, I uh, was supposed to go with the group of people who were invited to the special function last night after the general function here at the Town Hall, but then I met um, Dr Somerville and he scared me because he said, have you read Joe Williams' um, piece for the Harkness Henry lecture? I said, no! So I went rushing back to my hotel, scared as anything, that he might have said something that uh, would put at risk what I'm about to say, and he has, <laughs> as usual. I can say this about him because he used to be my boss. Of course, he was the Chief Judge of the Māori Land Court up until his elevation to the High Court. Um, and I realised as I was reading it, that's why he's on the High Court. He thinks in higher terms than I do. Um, and as a mere first instance judge, um, I, um, I had to say that uh, I read what he had to say with interest and some of it, um, after reflecting upon it and talking about it with Jacinta, Dr Jacinta, um, I decided he may have a point, but generally I disagree with him and I'll tell you why. <laughs> and by the way, he wouldn't find that unusual given our relationship in the past. Um, now, we intend, and I say we because I was helped uh, in preparing this paper by Chris Breton, who's one of our legal clerks in the Waitangi Tribunal, I thank him very much, and in order to make sure that his um, contribution is fully recognised, I've included him, so if there's anything wrong in the paper, I didn't do it. Um, but, and I'm sure many of you will find things that are wrong. Um, but, um, and that's because, and my caveat on my presentation today is I'm not an expert on RMA law. I, I do what all judges do um, when they're asked to perform their functions under legislation, but the real experts are the judges that I sit with, and they are the judges of the Environment Court, and I just want to acknowledge that right up front. My contribution when I have been on the Environment Court is to, to work through issues concerning um, balancing Māori interests, and that's what I've been involved with to date. I have never presided over anything on my own in this field, um, which is uh, probably a a response to some of what uh, Justice Williams said when he talked about being a generalist now in his piece. Um, but he did say, and I'm quoting um, from Dr Somerville, uh, one thing that I think we should note as we work our way through this. He said um, that the approach taken by the superior courts in some RMA cases has displayed that considerations of tikanga are compromised and are easily set to one side if necessary in pursuit of the Western and empirical view of sustainable management. And I thought about that and I thought that was interesting um, because he also wants to see um, further developments taking place uh, in, in this field. And it reminded me of when he was a student because I knew him, unfortunately for him, when he was a student. And he's, he's, he wrote the song, I was there when they wrote it, and it, was, it goes like this. Um, there's a movement, a movement on the street, people talking, oh sorry, people shuffling, shuffling to the beat. I hear them talking, talking on the street, words like freedom from oppression, because that's what our people need. Can you hear me? Now that means rise up and... Soon you should rise up, that's basically what he's saying. And I thought, well, even then he tempered his enthusiasm uh, because he said soon. Um, and um, as we know, there's been much happened since we were all students. Now, as a judge of the Māori Land Court, I have jurisdiction to make decisions such as authorising hapu petitions of Māori land or the establishment of Māori reservations without subdivision consents contrary to the standard requirements of the RMA. And this can lead to potential overlapping jurisdictional issues with the Environment Court, the more recent example being Grace and the Minister for Land Information. Um, as a presiding officer in the Waitangi Tribunal, 
I have made decisions critical of the RMA under the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi due to its impacts on Māori rights and interests. Yet, as an alternate judge in the Environment Court and as Deputy Chair for one of the EPA Boards of Inquiry on the Woody proposal for a prison, I've had to interpret and apply the RMA to Māori interests in the exact same manner so heavily criticised by the Tribunal. So if this presentation seems slightly schizophrenic, you will understand why. Can I begin by noting that the Waitangi Tribunal, as I've said, has been critical of um, the, the RMA uh, and its framework, and that criticism begins as early as 1993, just a couple of years after the Act was enacted. Uh, and in the Ngāwha Tribunal, the Tribunal said this, and I've also got this quote in full in the paper, but it basically said, our consideration of the provisions of the RMA, and in particular Part 2, which sets out the purpose and principles of the Act, leaves us with no option but to conclude that the Crown has not, in delegating extensive powers to local and regional authorities under the Act, ensured that its treaty duty of protection of Māori interests interest will be implemented, and it goes on. In the Y262 report, which um, Justice Williams presided over, the tribunal was still critical, and that's interesting because uh, that report is 2011, um, and the tribunal is still critical then of the RMA framework, saying um, the following. The RMA regime has the potential to achieve outcomes through provisions such as sections 33, 36B and 188, but they have virtually never been used to delegate powers to iwi or share control with them. Where some degree of control and partnership has been achieved, this has almost always been through historic treaty and customary rights settlements. We do not believe that iwi should have to turn to treaty settlements to achieve what the RMA was supposed to deliver in any case, which I think is interesting given what we heard this morning and some of the questions that were asked about, you know, to what extent does um, government intervention overcome democratic principles under the RMA? And I think that's another point that I might return to later. Um, so the tribunal has recommended on various occasions that the RMA be reformed. Um, initially, there was an obvious emphasis on Section 8. Let's get rid of that and change it and become more like Section 9 in the State Owned Enterprises Act. It's an easy answer and very attractive because it is so easy. Um, or, as this tribunal did, the Y262 tribunal, try to look at what's there and how the measures that are currently there might be improved. And so the tribunal in the Y262 claim um, essentially focused on these matters, that there should be enhanced opportunities for the de development and use of iwi management plans. There should be improved mechanisms for delivering control to Māori, a commitment to capacity building for Māori, and greater, greater use of the national policy statements and tools that are available under the Act. So I think that is another really interesting and different approach to what was previously said by the Tribunal with its emphasis on Section 8. So there's been, even in the Tribunal, a shift. Um, so as you know, the National Government has embarked upon the task of reforming, reforming the RMA, the Local Government Act 200, uh, 2002 and various other environmental statutes. Um, the first round of reforms has resulted in the Resource Management Amendment Act 2013, the Crown Minerals Amendment Act 2013, the Housing Accords and Special Housing Areas Act 2013, the Local Government Act 2002 Amendment Act 2014, and the Heritage New Zealand Pohere Taonga Act 2014, which replaced the Historic Places Trust Act 1993. Now, already existing in the 2002 Local Government Act, there were provisions that accommodated Māori interests to a certain degree, and those include Section 4, which has the treaty reference. And um, I just want to note that um, I included pretty pictures because I thought, well, by this stage you might be needing a bit of light relief. Um, 
And um, just to foreshadow the fact that the, the current arrangements, to a large degree, um, can be used in the way that the tribunal in Y262 wanted to see it used. And that's what I want to spend this part of the presentation emphasising. And so Section 4 in the Local Government Act 2002 um, did in fact have a treaty clause and it does attempt to um, at least acknowledge the principles of the treaty because it says to recognise and respect the Crown's responsibility to take appropriate account of the principles of the treaty and to maintain and improve opportunities for Māori to contribute to local government decision-making processes Parts 2 and 6 provide principles and requirements for local authorities that are intended to facilitate participation by Māori in local authority decision-making processes. Now, granted, there's a limitation to Parts 2 and Part 6, but the fact that um, that wording is used is important for our purposes because that wording now, that making it clear what the Crown envisages, uh, the legislation should provide in terms of the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi clearly set out. And that has become, interestingly, the pattern that has been adopted uh, in the reforms. And so that clause is going to become more and more a focus in terms of where we go to from here about how we're going to accommodate treaty principles um, in the case law that will have to focus on some of these issues in the future, I think. Anyway, I'm just not an expert, so. Um, many local authorities have attempted to engage Māori through the use of consultation processes, and I note uh, that Section 81, Schedule 10, Clause 8, Section 82, and 109 to 110 deal with Māori issues, um, engagement, consultation, and in the case of 109 to 110, rates remissions policies. Now, and most local authorities have obliged and have attempted to involve Māori in some way. Some have standing committees. Uh, Bay of Plenty Regional Council has taken it to the point of having, having Māori representation on the council through wards. Um, there are many other examples of initiatives taken by local authorities under the current arrangements. And the 2014 amendment to the Local Government Act, as you all know, has inserted two relevant provisions relating to planning that further enhance the opportunity for Māori participation. And the first is section 60, uh, 76AA, uh, requiring that local authorities must have a significance and engagement policy. And if you look at clause 11 of schedule 10, um, such policies must, amongst other things, be available for public scrutiny and of course whether or not a council is actively engaging will be reflected now uh, in these um, policy statements. So I think that's a good thing and a transparent way of dealing with what's happening in terms of things Māori. Um, under the Resource Management uh, um, Amendment Act 2013, um, councils will be required to consult more and be better informed of Māori interests when weighing the merits of relevant proposals and making decisions, and that's because of the new section that requires full eva evaluations to be undertaken. Um, those full evaluations under the new Schedule 4 at Clause 7 require that when assessing cultural effects of a proposed resource consent, that assessment must also consider cultural effects. And I think for the first time then, um, in a very, again, public way, councils are going to have to grapple with uh, some of the tikanga issues that Justice Williams raised. Um, and it's one thing to do that behind the scenes, it's quite another to have to do that and then explain uh, how you've done so publicly. In terms of fresh water, um, the National Policy Statement 2014, I think, is a, a radical um, new departure from where we have been in the past in terms of fresh water. And I say that because in 2007, the Central North Island Waitangi Tribunal found that the RMA regime for the management of fresh water was not a regime consistent with the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, 
because it failed to address the full nature and extent of Māori rights and interests in fresh water. In their view, it also found that its procedures failed to assure Māori of anything more than the right to be consulted, and it failed to provide for greater participation for Māori in freshwater management. Um, the Tribunal said quite a bit that was critical of the current framework, and um, since that report was released, uh, there's been a huge uh, sea change as far as fresh freshwater management is concerned in New Zealand. And from a Māori perspective, that background, the background to those reforms began when the Freshwater Iwi Leaders Group was formed in 2007. Uh, the group comprises the leaders of Tuwhare Toa, Ngaitahu, Te Arawa, Waikato Tainui and Whanganui. And the Freshwater Iwi Leadership Group saw an opportunity in the reforms when the national government decided to review the issue of fresh water in 2008 and 2009. And so they quickly engaged, when asked to do so, with the government on the issue, signing protocols with relevant ministers in 2009 to facilitate their engagement. Uh, and then they became members of the Land and Water Forum, um, who presented to this august body before. So that group, as you all know, produced their 2010 report, a fresh start for fresh water, and then to other, other reports, the first report uh, amongst other things, contributed to the 2011 statement, and then there was further reform undertaken, or policy development really, and then in March um, the government released a package of proposals, uh, and then we uh, come to nine, uh, 2014, and we now have the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water Management, 2014. Now, while developing its position, the government took into account from the Iwi Leadership Group and the Māori Party that there should be a reference to the Treaty of Waitangi in the National Policy Statement. They were also able to influence the work done to incorporate Māori values and interests into that new statement. And Deputy Prime Minister Bill English acknowledged their involvement in his evidence to the Supreme Court in the water rights case, noting that engagement by Māori on freshwater reform occurred through the Freshwater Iwi Leaders Group, the Land and Water Forum, and the Iwi Technical Advisors Group. And I see Tigitu is here, and he's on that group. Um, now, the national policy statement sets out it's the government's objectives in terms of freshwater, um, and it has included in the preamble um, a statement regarding the Treaty of Waitangi, uh, noting that the underlying foundation of the Crown Hapu relationship with regard to freshwater resources is what the statement is premised upon, and it goes on to seek to address tangata, value, tangata whenua values and interests across all of the well-beings, inc including the involvement of iwi and hapu in the overall management of freshwater. Um, one of the biggest uh, changes has been the inclusion of this concept of te mana o te wai, which is what the new policy statement refers to in the opening section on the national significance of fresh water. And while there are many issues, there may, there may be issues over what that means, because I think that term is going to raise a whole lot of tikanga issues, um, that there's been... Um, a sound attempt, I think, to try and reflect Māori aspirations as far as the management of fresh water by adopting that term. And um, the policy statement requires that regional councils in Objective D1 attempt to provide for the involvement of iwi and hapu and to ensure that tangata whenua values and interests are identified and reflected in the management of fresh water, including associated ecosystems. Um, the statement requires all local authorities to take reasonable steps to involve iwi and hapu in the management of freshwater and freshwater ecosystems in the region, to work with them to identify values and interests and to reflect those in management and decision making. So the experience of the iwi leadership forum on freshwater issues may be a precursor for the future development of national environment environmental standards concerning water as well, um, if that relationship continues. Um, and I'm 
keen to see what the government is going to do in this regard um, now that it's moving into the next phase of the reforms. Um, the other legislation that I think is really important to note is the Heritage New Zealand Pauhiri Taonga Act. That um, Act has included for the first time a treaty provision and very similar to the provision that already exists in the Local Government um, Act 2002. Um, so you may see a difference in approach as a result, or you may not, given that it is limited to various sections of the Act. And you can go through what the Act does when you look at my paper. I also note that Section 188 of the RMA has not been amended by that legislation, and so it appears to still be available as an option for Māori to apply to become a heritage authority under the legislation. Um, the use of the Treaty of Waitangi section uh, is interesting, and um, it could potentially open up further opportunities for Māori to engage to better protect uh, cultural sites. So um, that's, I think, a, a tick. Um, so there are various policy opportunities uh, that have been taken by Māori. Um, and before I get on to those, I note in terms of litigation what's been happening. There are opportunities, albeit expensive ones, and I do say they are expensive because in our court it only costs $65 to file an application. Um, that's to, compared to what you'd have to deal with in the Environment Court. Um, so there are opportunities to progress Māori issues through litigation, and recent trends in the Environment Court jurisprudence demonstrate an increasing um, sophistication and desire to deal with balancing Māori interests. And that's where I disagree to a certain degree with what Justice Williams had to say, because he's not um, first instance judge anymore. He can see things at a different level, obviously, but I see them as they happen on the ground and what you have to do in the day-to-day -day administration of dealing with cases before you. The, courts, uh, the, the court as it is now tends to override Māori issues only where there's a need to recognise and provide for other matters of national importance, um, and those matters may outweigh Māori considerations, uh, or where the purpose of the, under, of the RMA under Section 5 may be defeated, or where there are no reasonable alternatives available as a means of mitigating any adverse effects. Now, there are many decisions from the Environment Court that may be cited, and I have cited um, at least four, um, but there are many, and I didn't have time to put them all in. Um, in addition, two judges of the Māori Land Court, as you heard Judge Ken Nadine say yesterday, hold warrants as alternate judges in the court, myself and Judge Clark, and a simple application can be made to have one of us sit with an Environment Court judge to hear proceedings, and um, we have done so on a range of issues. And when I was listing all the cases, I thought, oh gosh, pretty soon it'll take over the whole page. Now, what all this indicates is that successive governments have recognised the importance of Māori interests in resource management. And I don't think that, uh, it, I think it overstates things to suggest that they haven't attempted to grapple with these issues in light of other responsibilities that central and local government have to consider. Um, so I was quite upbeat after I'd done all that. <laughs> and then I started looking at what was proposed for the reforms. So um, following the enactment of the RMA Amendment Act, um, the government has focused on the next phase of the reforms. Um, in February 2013, the Ministry for the Environment released their document, Improving Our Resource Management System, and it foreshadowed that one of the areas it was going to be looking at was Māori participation. And following the consultation round in September last year, the government released its resource management summary of reforms proposals. And of note are the reforms proposed for Māori participation. Um, those proposals require councils to invite iwi and hapu to enter into arrangements detailing how they will work together. Um, in this manner, the government appears to have grappled with the issue of iwi hapu participation as recommended in a number of the Waitangi Tribunal reports including YT62. Thus, and depending on what happens to these proposals during the legislative process, the reforms could provide further opportunities for Māori to be involved in decision-making. At the least, the government expectation is that the reforms will, quote, provide greater certainty over the role of iwi and hapu in the planning system 
and incentivise early engagement between iwi hapu and councils. Um, the further expectation is that this will avoid disagreements and unnecessary litigation. So you can see what's been proposed. Uh, as you know, we haven't yet got a bill, so we don't know the detail of it. But uh, one of the biggest criticisms is part two. Um, now, when I say part, there's criticisms, of course, there's people who are quite happy to see it amended. But those who are criticising it have said that they're worried about the elevation of competing values currently in Section 7 uh, and or others being added to the current list of matters of national importance. And from a Māori perspective, the com combined elevation of economic utilisation and development of values could potentially dilute the importance of Māori considerations in the RMA as each matter of national importance is weighed against the other. And thus the new proposals may militate against the opportunities created concerning iwi participation and planning or in terms of resource applications. Well, that's been the nature of the criticisms, I'm not sure. Um, I leave that for another day to make a full, fully informed assessment on. Anyway, the proposals for part two may change, however, as we know, given what the Environmental Defence Society and the New Zealand King Salmon case has, um, well, what the Supreme Court judges have found, and it's finding in particular that part two cannot trump the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. Um, Amongst other things, they said many things. I mean that, anyway. In light of that decision, it seems to me that there's an opportunity for Māori, if the reforms go through as they currently are rather vaguely articulated, but if they do, it seems to me that there's an opportunity to, for Māori to improve their position rather than have their interests weighed up at the back end of the process once a matter gets into litigation. Um, is to have the matters up front in the national policy statements and in or national environmental standards. Um, the su success of such an approach for Māori would depend, however, on whether those proposals remain the same or whether they'll be altered technically by further drafting in order to either uphold the position adopted by the Supreme Court or, or vary it. We, we don't know, so we'll have to wait and see. Now, with regard to the transfer of powers, the national government um, initially proposed to amend the criteria in the RMA to improve existing tools for participation, and those provisions are section 33 and the provision dealing with joint uh, management arrangements under section 36B. Um, anyway, that they proposed that in the first document that was released, the criteria for joint management arrangements and transfers of resource management responsibilities under the RMA would be amended to make them easier to be used for enabling iwi participation. And this would facilitate greater uptake of these underused tools. Well, if that were to happen, that of course addresses what the Y262 Waitangi Tribunal has said. But um, there's no clear statement of a similar type in the second document that was released by the government in, after the consultation round. So we don't know what's going to happen as far as section 33 and section 36 is concerned. Um, we only know that councils have, if anyone's got an example, I'd be pleased to hear it, but there's been no use of section 33 in favour of iwi authorities, and there's only one joint management arrangement, although there may be more because the, the last time anyone did an audit was 2009, so I stand to be corrected, and I didn't have time to ring up every council in New Zealand to find out. Um, so if there's only one, there can, you, know, you can say safely there'd be less than five in 2009, and in 2014 there'd be less than five, I'd bet. So that raises issues, because clearly the transfer of powers in some cases is what Māori are seeking. And linked as we know, to the reforms will be what further needs to happen in terms of the freshwater regime and whether or not there needs to be some fiddling around there as well concerning freshwater. So as we understand it, um, there's no bill, but it's a, a space that we have to keep watching. Now, I also wanted to, do, to address the environmental reporting bill. 
Um, it's still before select committee at the moment. But the bill proposes that domain reports be re produced in relation to topics prescribed by regulations, and it requires a secretary for the environment and the government statistician to publish domain reports on one of five environmental domains, air, atmosphere, climate, freshwater, land and marine, every six months, and publish a synthesis report. Now, in doing so, it, it's mandatory that domain reports include impacts on the state of the environment, um, including culture and recreation. So there may be an opportunity here again for Māori issues to be examined where the state of the environment is impacting uh, uh, on Māori cultural values uh, or the other way around. We'll see. Um, now, the, economic, the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf environmental effects act, I welcome this and um, the Waitangi Tribunal and the Petroleum Report that it released in 2011 was particularly concerned about the failure to manage environmental effects in the EEZ. Um, so this is an important development. And again, there is a treaty reference. Um, uh, in my paper, I say there are several sections of the 2012 Act that contain a reference to the treaty. It should read, for those of you who have looked, um, there is one section of the 2012 Act that contains a reference to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, and that's section 12. Other sec and it's, again, using that 2002 Local Government Act pattern. Um, so we are seeing that become the pattern in environmental management in New Zealand for recognising the treaty and the principles of the treaty. And other sections enable Māori participation, including sections 18, 32, 33, 39 and 45. And um, Dr. Ruru has just produced a wonderful article in Law Talk, which I thank her very much for, um, on the EPA Board of Inquiry into the Tasman, Trans-Tasman Resource Limited Marine Consent decision. Um, and she, I think, demonstrates in her little two-page piece um, how beneficial, uh, if you are a Māori advocate, you would find this legislation. And uh, that is well worth reading. It's in the September 2014 issue of Law Talk. In terms of the Crown Minerals Act, 1991, um, as I noted, the Waitangi Tribunal in the Petroleum Report 2011, there's been two petroleum reports, had you not realised. One was 2003, Justice Williams presided over that. And then 2011, it's uh, Judge Harvey. And the panel was very critical of the way um, the Crown Minerals Act failed to, to address adequately, in its view, um, Māori participation in, in um, Crown Minerals management. And um, it said, amongst other things, that there should be greater participation and use of national policy statements and national environmental standards to provide guidance to councils. And so the Crown Minerals Amendment Act, I'm not sure it's because of it, because it's never stated overtly, but it is interesting that incrementally we are seeing these changes in line with what the tribunal has said, although I note the freshwater matter was all about, you know, allocating freshwater. It wasn't anything to do with the tribunal, but there is you know, some, some converging of direction happening here. And that act has provided further opportunity, that's the Crown Minerals Amendment Act, um, for Māori interests to be accommodated because the amendment does um, now have um, this new tier system of providing permits. Well, aside from section four, which was always there, and that's the one that recognises the treaty principles, but section 30. 3C requires Tier 1 and Tier 2 permit holders to report annually to the Minister on permit holders' engagements with iwi and hapu in whose area some or all of the permit is, you know, where it's situated. So the additional notice requirements where Māori land is concerned have not been touched, they still remain uh, in place. So in addition, a new Section 14 provides that mineral programs must be set out or describe how um, the Minister and Chief Executive will have regard to the principles of the treaty and for the purposes of, of a minimal programme and the Petroleum Programme 2013 and the Minerals Programme 2013 have both been issued 
and Clause 3 of Schedule 1 of that programme, uh, both programmes, refer to, to the treaty and set out the detail for consultation with iwi and hapu. Uh, there are new annual reporting requirements for permit holders on their engagement with iwi specified in those um, schedules. So, you know, when you look at what's there, there's been huge changes uh, even since 2011. Now, I want to move on to deal with the treaty um, and how that's changing things. Now, first thing I want to deal with is the Treaty of Waitangi Fisheries Claims Settlement Act, which is an old statute, it's 1993, but it's starting to receive some prominence in RMA matters, and I say that because of in Tirunanga Ongaitahu Tarangi Trust and others in the Bay of Plenty Regional Council, um, that was the case about the Port of Tauranga's harbour dredging. The Environment Court accepted that the effects of dredging the Tauranga harbour on a Mataitai reserve created under this legislation should form part of the overall Part 2 analysis under the RMA. And I think that that's an interesting, because, an interesting development because um, Mataitai reserves are about place, not fish. And most other matters dealt with under this legislation concern fisheries. So there'd always been this thought, well, if it's about fisheries, then it can't have any relevance to RMA matters. Well, uh, the argument was successful in the Environment Court, whether that ever stacks up on appeal. Well, it did, actually, this matter went to the High Court, and the High Court upheld the matter as Judge Justice Priestley. So whether that's what the Supreme Court would find, I don't know. The next piece of legislation is the Marine and Coastal Tagutai Moana Act, and as you know, this repeals the Foreshore and Seabed Act 2004. It therefore makes a number of amendments to the RMA. One of the major effects uh, concerns the development of Māori um, customary rights and Māori marine title. Um, and where a group has customary marine title, Holders are granted an RMA per permission right, which includes the ability to give or decline permission for certain activities in specified areas covered by a customary marine area. So, and of course, there's a, an appeal right from that. So, already in that legislation, you can see Māori are starting to receive not just through the treaty recognition of treaty interests, not just the opportunity to participate, but some right to be involved in governance and management in a substantive way. Um, and then we have the treaty settlement process. Well, all of you should know that there are ongoing and significant amendments made to the RMA occurring, um, especially to Schedule 11. Schedule 11 lists the settlement acts that contain statutory acknowledgements, and it's continually updated as new settlement acts are enacted. And what those acknowledgements tend to do is they recognise the mana of the iwi and hapu associated with a particular area within a, a local authority district. And um, these are um, very important for the local iwi and hapu because that means that they don't have to prove that they have an interest over and above the average um, applicant. Um, and uh, it's recognised that they have treaty interests, which helps when you start to invoke treaty principles in RMA law. Um, and then the joint management agreements that are being pursued, um, not under the RMA, but as part of treaty settlement legislation. And there are a number of these, and they've become very prominent in settlement legislation. And Natalie Coates produced a very useful article on why that might be so. And rather than read that, I'll just note it for you all. But Māori have seemed to prefer to pursue the opportunity to influence RMA outcomes through the treaty settlement process. And beginning with the Ngaitahu Claim Settlement Act 1998, that trend had, was started. Now, I just uh, had, I had my phone up here, not because I was going to be rude and start ringing people, but because today in the Dominion Post, and you won't have read that because you all get the Otago one, because I know they gave it to me at my hotel, Naitahu are very upset at the moment about the fact that the Chatham Rock phosphate plan to mine phosphate from the Chatham Rise seabed. And uh, it's about to go to the EPA. Now, the difference between Naitahu and Tainu, who both received their settlements approximately the same time, is that 
um, Tainu reserved the, their rights about the river, and so the river's only just been dealt with, whereas Ngaitahu didn't. And you can see now that had it been 2014, that Ngaitahu may have taken a totally different approach given what it's doing in, in Canterbury at the moment. But um, if the, the circumstances had been different, we, we may have seen a different involvement of Ngaitahu. Here they're going to have to be a litigant. Uh, in Tainu, where they've, we've had the recent joint management arrangement developed there under their settlement le legislation, they're going to decide what happens to the river in concert with other interests concerning the river. So there's a whole sea change that's happened even since 1998 to 2011, and Māori are doing it through the treaty settlement process. They're not mucking around with the RMA process. Now, whether that's right or whether that's wrong, that's what's happening. And so um, I, in the paper, just explore what, uh, what Taino are doing. And then I also note what's a further development, and that is these new entities called environmental personalities that are coming through the treaty settlement process. Um, and as you know, there's this trend now to recognise sites, cultural areas of importance as environmental entities in their own right. So the Te Uruwera Act to 2014, for example, um, declares the Te Uruwera National Park area almost, sort of, um, to be a legal entity given all the rights and duties of a legal person. And those powers and duties, um, in terms of management, are to be exercised on its behalf by Te Uruwera Trust Board, which I think is a really fascinating development. And what will that mean um, in the future? Wow. And then likewise, the Whanganui River Settlement, which hasn't yet found its way into legislation, um, but it will soon, um, that will see um, the river become a legal entity in its own right. And again, the Whanganui people will have a large say of what happens in terms of management. So at play in the treaty settlement process is a pattern of involvement for Māori that the Y262 Tribunal recommended uh, even though it was dismissive of the fact that why should Māori use that process when the RMA should provide for all? Well, the RMA may not be able to, and so Māori have chosen this direct intervention route, which is to go directly to the Crown, and when you can think, think, th think that through, you can see why, um, if you're a Māori advocate and you're trying to promote those interests, um, you might take that route because it's shorter. So the conclusion... Um, some significant steps have been taken by successive governments to increase the practical involvement of Māori in resource management, leading to increased opportunities for participation and appropriate consultation. Certainly the UWI Leaders Forum has not been slow to seize the opportunity to influence the RMA reforms, and when asked to collaborate have done so, and that's led to the Freshwater Statement. However, there's no certainty that reforms will continue to deliver. It remains to be seen what will happen to part two of the RMA, for example, and it's still uncertain what will happen to sections 33 and 36B. The conclusion should not be, however, uh, sorry, that conclusion shouldn't detract from the obvious massive effort to engage Māori in resource and environmental management. And uh, Chris and I consider that significant incremental progress has been made to address many of the Waitangi Tribunal's findings and recommendations. Um, treaty settlement legislation, however, remains the primary route for Māori opportunities to influence the RMA, and it's resulted more, in more than mere technical amendments. It's resulted in real and meaningful transfers of management authority. And what can be said is that there's this discernible pattern happening in the legislation, both in terms of treaty clauses and in terms of joint management regimes. And um, we were asked to consider whether the treaty settlement process is the best way forward for Māori. Well, for the most Māori it has been, whether that is best for an integrated resource management regime is another question for other people, not a judge to answer. So kia ora koutou.
My 10-minute slot is really from a local uh, perspective, looking back, bearing in mind that local includes the wider Ngaitahu Rohi, which goes as far north, is nearly as far north as Blenheim, and the experiences we have gleaned from there. But uh, really where my heart rests is if sitting, standing on my hills, looking uh, at the Otago Harbour or the, the ocean either side, that's really where I like to be, and it was the advent of the, or the potential of an aluminium smelter at Aramoana that really triggered my interest in environmental matters, quickly followed by the Waitangi Tribunal arriving at our, at our marae. Anyway, in terms of the RMA reform proposals um, to achieve greater clarity and action on the role of iwi and hapu in local government uh, uh, resource management planning, it, it is a welcome uh, possibility. However, as I mentioned earlier, the changes, possible changes to section six and seven in favour of economic development may weaken the, the environmental outcomes. New requirements for section 32 evaluations would add transparency, however, to the iwi hapu advice and how it is considered. A requirement for councils to invite iwi hapu to enter into an arrangement that details how they will work together through planning processes, I think, is very would be a very constructive uh, element. Uh, and in, around iwi plans, it would be an important step forward for councils to negotiate with iwi hapu on how an iwi plan is to be uh, factored into the planning processes it would have much merit. In the Otako Takiwa, which I mentioned where I am from, our connection to our lands, waters and other taonga are centuries old. Connection is of a kinship nature and it is reflected in our stories, our waiata, haka, place names, mahika kai activities, values, a myriad of other interconnections. Management and use by our people mirrored that kinship. It is what we are, who we are, what we are known for. And the great challenge has been to uphold and exercise that kinship duty. Interestingly, all the uh, various in, um, legislative instruments that Judge Fox was talking about tells you that we do get consulted quite a bit. My interest is on a framework that actually works for us, that actually is effective, and utilise this, or our time put, input is, is producing results. And I think that's a slowly emerging factor, but it's been hard work up to this point. The treaty successive uh, generations of ours have agitated the Crown since 1848 over land, land loss, natural resource issues, and threats of alienation to our thong. The 1877 declaration by Chief Justice Prendergast that the treaty was worthless and a simple nullity influenced government decision making for decades. Could be 100 years nearly. Māori activism over land and resource loss from the late 60s propelled the treaty back into uh, prominence. And with the arrival of the RMA Act in 91, we, uh, as observer, were observers rather than active participants in the environment, environmental management of our, of our Taonga at that time. But we welcomed it. It looked like uh, new opportunities to rejuvenate those associations and that influence that uh, were keenly sought. Part two of the Act gave hope in that respect for involvement and recognition in the way that the natural resources would be managed. Our ensuing engagement with councils and their planning processes opened new doors. But translating that to actually effect on the ground and through the decision-making processes was cosmetic at best. The idea of co-management has not been fully, if at all, realised here in Otago. 
Many of the resources or taonga of value to our people were environmentally challenged and under threat. So uh, to articulate publicly our um, values in connection, we developed iwi resource management plans, the first one in 1995 uh, and in the second edition in 2005. That second edition actually advanced to including policies uh, for resources and activities. It was a significant exercise for our people to develop those two plans uh, and it was not commensurate with the effect they have had on resource management decision making in the region. I don't think who locally are likely to review the, or is likely to review the current iwi plan given the weak statutory provision for iwi plans and the ease with which they can be sidelined. But this is not to overlook the gains made locally with local government in the various plans and processes and positive relationships that have been building and are building outcomes. In terms of the Ngaitahu settlement, 1998. By the time negotiations were underway for that settlement in 1997, we realised that the RMA was not being applied consistently and engagement with our whānau and hapu across the region was variable. And I'm talking from 80, 80-90% of Te Waipanami, the South Island, where I think nearly half the councils in the country exist. So the Ngaitahu settlement introduced statutory acknowledgements and also there was a requirement for MFE to make annual visits to councils um, to see how they were dealing with iwi resource management plans. Both of these instruments had limited effect, in particular the statutory acknowledgements were meant to be used as, a, as examples or a template that could be transferred to other in particular waterways. When you think in terms of Waikato, they focused on the Waikato. We have probably 23 what we would call major rivers and who's going to tell any one hapu that their river is not as important as the other? So, and we were only allowed originally I think six SAs, I think we got 13 or something like that. The idea was for them to be transferred right across and be applied to all waterways in our tribal territory. It hasn't happened and in some instances, uh, we have been um, confined to those sites where the statutory acknowledgements exist. The, some wetlands, the bed of Te Waihora, Lake Ellesmere, and Nohuanga were part of the settlement package. An important point is that at that time, both Crown and Aita who agreed that ownership of water was off the table. It was not part of the settlement negotiations a bridge too far at that time. That's why Ngaitahu is still in the process now. Uh, those questions have yet to be answered. Now, the best and the worst. Fortunately, it's not in Otago. Possibly the worst and the best of the engagements within our tribal area, area are exampled in Canterbury. The current relationship with ECAN is exemplary. At the time of the appointment of the commissioners, it was probably at its lowest ebb for iwi relationships, as you know from many other things as well. Uh, in terms of, I won't go any further there. Oh, I've only got 10 minutes. Other, <laughs> other iwi settlements post the Ngaitahu settlement, and it all, was always our desire, because we were one of the first cabs off the rank, that the ball would be carried forward, and Judge Fox has certainly alluded to that. That is occurring, and it is important that it does. We can't be just locked into one example at the early stage and then that be, be applied across all settlements. Because the depth and the associations of, uh, are immense in, in various iwi uh, rohi. So the Waikato River settlement is interesting in that respect and it brings direct decision making powers to the iwi there. So that's, that's great. And uh, possibly provides uh, examples that could be followed elsewhere. The Waitangi Tribunal has made recommendations seeking to enhance opportunities, improve mechanisms and build Māori capacity. Treaty settlement negotiation at government level is resulting 
and improved iwi hapu involvement in co-management models and invaluable, and invaluable, invaluable examples uh, are occurring. The advent of the iwi leaders' advocacy role in conjunction with the Māori Party intervention has had a positive effect, we think, on the national governments. Freshwater planning and other reform processes, uh, and we're hoping also that that continues forward. It's important that it does. National policy statements may be a way to avoid death by a thousand cuts through the myriad of planning and decision processes and differing interpretations. The recent King Salmon decision by the Supreme Court reduces the scope for the part two overall judgment notion to water down key provisions of the, the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. And I was on that board of inquiry also. Um, the national policy state, statement route could assist in achieving more uniform and consistent uptake by councils and enhancing involvement of iwi, hapu and environmental management processes. So in, in conclusion, 20 years on, the promise of the RMA has produced mixed results for iwi hapu despite plenty of good intention and endeavour on all sides. The ECAN example shows what can be achieved when commissioners are appointed and pertinent to that negative politics being re removed at least temporarily from the process, resulting in remarkable growth in the re relationship between NATO and ECAN. Gains have been made and tools grown or identified through treaty processes and Waitangi Tribunal recommendations. National instruments such as MPSs and NESs can provide greater direction and consistency, consistency to iwi hapu involvement. Uh, the national gov government reforms, well, we wait to see how that goes. And I haven't really touched on litigation, but we have used that, uh, I suppose, judiciously. Uh, it is pretty hard, though, at a hapu level to, to wield that stick at, at every occasion. But it has its place. I think that's about 10 minutes. Kia ora tātou. Thank you, Judge Fox, um, Komatoa Edward Allison, uh, for a wonderful insight through the looking glass into the framework of Māori and environmental law. And Edward, as you said, it's been a long time educating the Crown, particularly Iwi taking that stance from 1840 onwards and then the Waitangi Tribunal from the late 1970s onwards. And I think we're now at the brink of a new era of something really exciting and not just recognising Māori, well, at best as partners, but sometimes still more commonly as stakeholders, which is a little bit more problematic. But I think we're now moving to something even more exciting, as Judge Fox and, and Edward have been alluding to here, is how to build tikanga Māori into environmental law and what this is going to mean for a new look environmental law here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I wish we had time now for questions but I'm going to make the decision not to hold you from your lunch, but really welcome you to come and engage with Judge Fox and with Edward Allison over lunch. Um, and really just join me now in thanking these two very special guests um, here to the Resource Management Law Association Conference. Um, tēnā kōroa.